Hey everyone, before we start the video, I want to make a few short announcements. Firstly, I have a blog now. This is where I post about content that's either too small or too theoretical or too boring for their own video. I've written a few posts already and I'm looking forward towards tackling more. You can find it at cybercatworks.blogspot.com. Don't worry, I'll put a link in the description. More importantly, however, I want everyone to pay some attention to a friend of mine who has finished their first music album. If you like experimental industrial music, then I would highly recommend you check out Derivative. You can check out their work on derivativedeathdroid.bandcamp.com and pre-order their first album, which will also be released on September the 18th. I will put a link to this in the description as well. Now, without further ado, on with the show. All right, here's the next question. Are you ready? Yes. Here we go. If you had the power to control everyone's mind, to change, and you, would, and you could change the world for the better in any way that you see fit, would you do it? It is an interesting scenario. Yes, but would you do it? Wielding such immense power and not thinking about the consequences. To think that with a simple thought, I could control the destiny of all mankind on a scale that is unprecedented on in human history. Would I do it, you say? Yes, I would do it. That kind of power would set me up above the gods. And soon I shall have that power. Unlimited power. Power is a strange thing. It has existed throughout the ages and has been a main driving force behind conflict in human history. It was power that allowed Alexander the not so bad to lead his armies and conquer a swath of land from the Hellenistic world to northern India. It was power that drove the European empires to commit atrocities in the transatlantic slave trade. Finally, it was power that saw the Nazis to try to take over Europe and commit genocide in the name of their abhorrent ideas. But what really is power? We cannot see it, nor can we really measure it. It is an abstract thing that, although intangible, can be just as restrictive as the gravity that ties us to this planet. To answer that question really depends on whom you ask, but I think that there is a small group of people who have answered this question in about the most encapsulating way I could find. In the late 1950s, researchers French and Raven analyzed the complexities of power and power dynamics, and since then many people have added to their work. This group of people defined power as the ability to achieve results or compliance from another individual, or the aptitude to modify someone's behavior. The definition basically states that the more you can influence people to do what you want, the more powerful you are. If you think about it, is this a pretty horrifying definition? It sketches power as a tool for people to enact their will onto others regardless of the consequences or the consent of others. This definition is all fine and good, but it leaves something to be desired. How do you gain power? How do you influence people? How does this all work? I may not be able to answer all of these questions, but I'm certain that I can at least answer some of them. For you see, the work done by French, Raven and others actually elaborates on this a bit more. They hypothesize that all power is derived from five bases of power, which can all be categorized in two categories. 
these five bases are reference power, expert power, legitimate power, reward power and coercive power. Out of these five, reference and expert would fall under the informal power category, while legitimate, reward and coercive would fall under the formal power category. These, three, these two categories exist to distinguish between the sources of power. Reference and expert are called informal powers because they exist without any formal authority backing them up, meaning that almost everyone can wield this power without having any official authority to support them. Formal powers, on the contrast, do at least have some kind of authority backing them up. Though their agree of being official is honestly often debatable. As a result, these powers require one to be in a certain position in society before they can be used. Let us discuss the informal ones first. Reference power is also sometimes called personal power, because it's based on the way one perceives another person. It is based on the respect and admiration one has gained over time. Being respected by others gives one a certain power over others. It allows them to have at the very least a certain say in things, or in some cases even run the show in certain political structures. There are many ways one can gain respect or admiration. One could have done an impressive feat in the past and gain respect for that. Or in some cultures one could have reached a certain age and therefore be assumed to be more experienced in life and revered for it. Keeping this in mind, it should come as no surprise that most politicians in many western countries are still older white men. <laughs> this respect does not just come because of a feat or even because of old age, on the other hand. Charisma is also an important factor in this. A person that is well liked by everyone but has not accomplished a whole lot can still be pretty powerful. This is most likely to do something that has been called the likability factor. In our capitalist world, the appearance of being well off often turns one into a status symbol and this gives them a certain power. A good example of this would be something like an Instagram influencer, someone like, let's say, Kendall Jenner. She does not have any formal authority, is neither an expert on anything, nor does she have the experience of age. However, due to her privileged starting position, being born relatively wealthy, and her appearance of being a successful businesswoman, gives her immense influencing power. Companies and organizations know this, and can often contact her to promote their products and services, because they know that because of her influence, she can spread a message or sell a product very easily thus influencing or modifying the behavior of a large group of people. As a side note, I'm not saying this to shit on Kendall Jenner, she's just a very good example of this type of reference power, please be nice to my comments section. Reference power, although informal, can also be used as a method to obtain formal power, by appearing to be admirable or respectable and leveraging wealth one can gain the backing of a formal authority like a state or a multinational company relatively easy in this regard. Reference power can therefore be used as a starting point. Many scammers and con artists work like this as well, appearing to be successful and therefore luring you into a false sense of security for them to exploit you. Expert power is related to this, but works a bit differently. This power is based on an individual's knowledge regarding a subject or specialties, or in some cases the appearance of an individual's knowledge. Medical professionals are a good example of this. A doctor is expected to know more about certain subjects than a regular person does. This gives them a certain power over others. What? You think you can fix that broken kidney of yours yourself? Yeah, good luck with that. This is still called an informal power, because one does not necessarily need an authority to support this power. I myself, for example, would say that I am generally speaking semi-decent regarding the maintenance of personal computers. This means that my authority in this regard comes from my experience of years messing around with computer hardware and software. However, I did not go to a school for this, 
and I therefore do not have a paper that says BIM is an expert on computers. You should listen to them and do whatever they want. Although I am saying that I can do whatever I want. It should be noted that expert power is also often related to referent power. Due to practicing one's referent power in the form of charisma or social standing, one can appear to be an expert on this subject and thus practice power this way. Many right-wing grifters and agitators work like this. People like Bina Sharknado, Pajama Watson and Alex I eat 12 Rolexes for dinner Jones employ this quite heavily. Most of the drivel that comes out of the mouths of these people are either lies, half-truths or made-up stories that would not be out of place in a book of right-wing fairy tales. However, because they present their stories in a professional and therefore respectable way, they can appear to be expert on what they're talking about, pretending that they know what they're saying and thus peddle their lies to the public, agitating violence and pushing people to buy their shitty products. Of course, you can make the argument that I myself, as a YouTube armchair activist, do the same thing. And you would not be entirely wrong about that. The way I present my videos is done deliberately in a way to make it seem like I'm very knowledgeable on certain subjects. The difference is, however, that I try to be as truthful as possible in this regard. YouTube has given me a small but solid platform from which I can propagate my message. I am fully aware of this, however, and I try to act as, as ethical as possible in this regard, but not everyone does that. Parasocial relationships can work like this. We hear more than often than we should that certain content creators or other online figures get harassed by a mob of people because some other online content creator or online figure has incited people, often unwillingly or unknowingly, to do so. This is the result of people trying to pass reference power as expert power. Alright everyone, welcome to a monthly employee presentation. You might recognize me as Eric Franklin from the sales department. And I'm here to tell you all about the new, new developments we are doing at Teat Technologies Incorporated. We are having a lot of new stuff to show. All thanks to our loyal wage slaves, I mean employees, working very hard to make sure that our company shines above everyone else when it comes to dental technology. For example, our revolutionary 3D printing team has worked very hard to make sure that we can start pumping out new dangers in weeks. Soon we will be able to take a 3D scan of our customers' teeth and make a denture based on that cheaply and efficiently. This will be sure to raise our stock prices. Woo! Yeah, sorry that I'm interrupting, but as the only member of this so-called revolutionary 3D printing team, I have to ask. Your revolutionary 3D printing team currently consists of an autistic person and a cheap 3D printer that can barely print a denture without the alignment being wrong and it's turning into a mountain of molten plastic. I understand that you also show this presentation to our customers. Aren't you overselling this a bit? Yeah, nonsense! We have full trust in your capabilities to deliver on our promises. After all, you did make some fine catch that you right? You will be able to print a 3D danger in, out in no time. A cat statue is one thing, but a danger needs to be very precise and form-fitted so that it doesn't cause discomfort for the individual. I cannot just print a danger and expect it to fit for every person. Honestly, I'm not even sure if I can print a danger at all. All of my results have proven to be of insufficient detail for a good fit. I am already pushing the limits of what I have. There's no way that I can deliver on the promises you make to our customers. Calm down, Pim. It will be fine. Just let us do the talking and things will be fine. The sketch you just saw was a dramatized reenactment of something that actually happened to me. At a former job of mine, I was tasked to see if using a 3D printer to print cheap dentures was even remotely viable. 
I gave it a shot, and the result was that the 3D printer that I had was not precise enough for it. I'm still not sure what I did, but I somehow must have given both management and the sales department the impression that I was a 3D printing expert or something, because during a monthly employee presentation they came up with this. This is an example of where I apparently displayed enough reference power and expert power to convince people that I could somehow pull this off. They were not happy when I found out that no, what they wanted was not possible. This shows us how power can often backfire when things are not going as planned. The issue is that with a show of power or experience, there comes an expectation of what you can or cannot do. And if you fail to live up to that expectation, then you might find yourself into hot water. Power is a fickle thing after all, and it give it or take it away. Legitimate power is the power you get when you are sanctioned or justified by a group or individual to exercise said power. You are given a certain legitimacy to practice this power. What justifies said power differs from case to case, but a good example would be the justification the old European monarchies used to enslave their people in the bondage of serfdom and feudalism the so-called divine right to rule. This was a reason they stated for their power. If God did not want them to rule, then surely he would have stopped them from ruling. This does make me wonder if the French Revolution was part of God's will then. Hmm. Legitimate power is a very iffy power. It is the strongest of all powers but it's usually unclear who decides to legitimize what for which reason. We live in a society where we are forced to participate by the standards set by a state or government, who claims to have legitimate reasons to do so. However, we don't get to choose what these standards are, and the reasons are often counter to what a person truly wants or needs. So what might appear to be legitimate for one person might not be the same for another. This often leads to frictional conflict. Culturally speaking, the legitimacy of one cultural aspect might not work with another. You can have institutions that claim to be secular, for example, but also often sneak in religious reasons for their legitimacy, and this will cause frictions with those that are hurt because of what such religious viewpoints might entail. American far-right evangelists are a good example of how religious authority can be used to justify hatred and destruction. Authority is something that is not distribu distributed equally, and I would argue that most people run into issues with this one way or another. Come on, boy. I get that you're not interested in marrying your cousin, but you have to think of the bloodline. It's one of the few things that give us power over the revolting masses. No! I don't want to, father. Cousin Lizzie is mean and pushes me around. I am in love with the fair maiden that works in our garden. Don't even joke about that. Do you have any idea about the damage this could do to our legitimacy? We could lose everything our ancestors worked so hard to achieve. No, I don't care about your legitimacy. I am a prince. Why can't I live my own life and make my own decisions? It is exactly because you are a prince that you need to marry her. We are in a very vulnerable position right now. We had an invasion of the Aztecs, a famine, and a reformation bullcrap to do with. To top it all off, we had a comet soaring through the sky last week and scaring the devil out of those peasants. We are on the brink of destruction. You, refusing to do this, could push us over the edge. Do you want to end up like those people in Dit Martian? You always bring up Dit Martian like it's some kind of magical spell. What about Dit Martian scares you so much? 
In Dit Martian, I can marry whoever I want and not be forced into marriage with someone like Lizzie. Because if the people find out that they can cover themselves, then we are done for. We could both end up being killed and our country would be in ruins. God has given us the responsibility to prevent this. And I'll be damned if my own son refuses to go through with this. Now, put on your cloak, grab your ceremonial staff and walk to the aisle. Hm. Down with the tyrants! Long live the peasant republic! Ah! Revolutions and uprisings have historically been the way for those who are hurt by authority to challenge the legitimacy l levied by legitimate power. By accumulating the power of mass action, a group can get a certain legitimate power themselves and use that to challenge the legitimacy of an authority. It should be noted that the definition of a revolution can be very broad. It can be a violent uprising, but it can also be other actions like a general strike or a large amount of civil disobedience. There's nothing more frightening for authorities than a mass action like this. It challenges their legitimacy and it shows to, shows to those under their thumb that the justification they have used to rule might not be so justified after all. Reward power is probably the most straightforward of the power. It is, it is a power based on rewarding people for doing what you want them to do. You can give or withhold something someone wants based on their performance and actions. The idea is to add a positive element to an environment or remove a negative element from an environment to motivate someone to do something for you. The most basic of example that I can think of that almost everyone recognizes is being a kid and getting rewarded by your parents or guardians for doing chores like home homework or household chores. Your parents slash guardians want you to do something and they promise you a reward, playtime, access to certain toys, etc. based on you doing what they want you to do. This gives them a certain power over you. Now, of course, if they are responsible parents, they do this to teach you how to do certain chores and don't overdo it with the chores and the rewards. But unfortunately, not many people are responsible parents. Rewards power, however, can also be pretty manipulative. If someone gives you something, you often feel indebted to that person and people can exploit that feeling to blackmail and manipulate you. The final base of power is coercive power. This is probably the shadiest and most surface level unethical of the power. Coercive power is in a sense the opposite of reward power. Rather than adding a positive element to an environment, you are adding a negative element to an environment or removing a positive one. You have the ability to punish or penalize someone for their actions. And no, I don't mean in the fun way. Coercive power can range from shaming someone publicly to the most extreme torture and human rights abuses you can imagine. It has the widest range of actions that can be taken to motivate someone and it has a long history of being used. With that said, despite the extreme measures that are taken by coercive power users, it is not as effective as you might think. It has been speculated that coercive power often relies on a few individuals in workplaces for it to work. If these individual leaves or are not present anymore, everything that relied on coercive power to function falls apart like a card house. In one of the most extreme examples, in Nazi Germany in the final years of the wars, there were a slurry of uprisings and rebellions in occupied territories and concentration camps. Hell, in occupied Yugoslavia there were uprisings and rebellions from the moment the Nazis set foot on the soil. Turns out that if you're only using the metaphorical boot to stomp down on people, it builds up resentment. Something that will come back to bite you in the ass once you lose the ability to pick up your coercion. The lynchings that happened in Europe shortly after the fall of the Nazi regimes across Europe is a good example of this. 
if there is one silver lining of this, then it is that co coercion also ferments rebellion, and history has shown that there is usually a tipping point in which rebellion explodes. The coercion starts building pressure, like the build up of steam in a boiler. Eventually the pressure becomes too much and the boiler explodes. So, these are the five bases of power. Referent, expert, legitimate, reward and coercive. This is all nice and interesting, but what's the point of this all? Well, I'm glad you ask. You see, as the filthy leftist red that I am, I'm very interested in power. Especially how to dismantle it. Power, and especially political power in our current society, works via a hierarchy. Of course, as a autistic anarchist, I have often in my life run into issues with these hierarchies and the way that power works. I would argue that the goal of most anarchists, socialists, communists, etc. is to dismantle these hierarchies and power structures and replace them with better egalitarian alternative. The five, power, the five bases of power, as dictated by French and Raven, are the result of the formation of our capitalist society. It is capitalism and the hierarchies that come with it that ferment these powers and propagate them at the expense of everyone else. The most basic definition of anarchism is an opposition to unjust hierarchy and political power like this in particular. We also recognize that most if not all of these hierarchies and power structures are weaved into each other. We therefore say that you cannot really abolish one of these hierarchies or structures without abolishing the others. This is in opposition to how most liberals and liberal politicians see fighting for justice. They think that you can create a rainbow crossing and then you are done. We now have gay rights apparently. <coughs> Honestly, if you think about it, that's the biggest difference between left-wing and right-wing ideas. Right-wing ideas are very individualistic, so if there's a problem, they think that removing or replacing some people will solve the issue. This is why you have so many Dutch far-right people online thinking that closing the borders and leaving the EU will somehow solve all of our problems. The reden dat de hashtag EU niets doet aan het coronavirus is uitdunnen van de bestaande bevolking van Europa. De quote-unquote vergrijzing in één keer wegvaren is duizenden woningen quote-unquote vrij. For all that ongewenste immigratie straatvel. It's all in the game and we are losing. Hashtag grenzen dicht. Hashtag nexit. Hashtag BVV. Hashtag FAD. Leftist rats like us, however, look at the bigger picture. When something bad happens, we ask ourselves questions like what drove someone to do what they did? What were their material conditions? How did the power structures cause this? Doing this for over 100 years has led us to the conclusion that the way power works in our society is seriously fucked up and often harms people more than that they benefit people. If there's anything I would like people watching this to take away from it, then I hope it's a basic understanding of how power works and how to analyze and critique it. Maybe one day we can live in a world where we can help each other without needing to rely on such power structures to do stuff. However, until that time comes, the struggle must go on. So, I uh, was looking around uh, on the web shop, shopping around for a crown for my feudalism sketch. And while I was looking around, I also encountered this. So, uh, I found it to be kind of silly, so I bought it. So, I'm now going to try it on. So, let us remove the packaging here, we don't need that anymore. And let's see how it fits. Wow. 
I am Master Dukon, and you shall obey me. You will like and subscribe to this video, or else you will risk suffocation by Dukons. <laughs>